Hi y'all, let's continue our lessons in BGP. This is section 1.3. We'll talk about how BGP really converges because normally you hear a lot of stuff about BGP convergence, but you don't dive into it and really try to understand how this protocol converges in the real world. So let's begin someplace very, very simple. We're mostly gonna deal with withdrawals rather than updates because the update process with the AS path was kind of covered in the 1.2 section, just talking about how the AS path is built. So let's talk about how we would remove 100 colon colon slash 64 from the network. So what's going to happen here is that C is going to average if this link fails, C is going to send what is called a withdraw to D and E. Now this is going to be in IBGP because these are IBGP um, peering sessions here then D is going to build an, uh, an update, which is a withdraw, a withdraw from D to 65,003 and E to 65,004. Now, 65,003 is going to send a withdraw to 5, 65,004 is going to send a withdraw to 5, and then 5 is going to send a withdraw to, to 65,002. This seems pretty straight, but how fast do these withdraws propagate through the network for real? There is a timer in BGP called the min route advertisement interval. This is primarily designed much like an SPF or an LSP or LSU delay timer is in a link state protocol. This is a timer that creates a little bit of hysteresis in the network to slow down the updates a bit so that you won't get so many updates in your network from a single failure. For instance, let's say again, this 100 colon colon slash 64, it uh, falls over. At T1, we have two updates sent to 3 and 4. Now, if I were not to have this MRAI, I would have at T2 two different updates sent here. But let's say we just got a little bit differently in our timing so that at T1, we have these up two updates here. And then at T2, we have this update from 4 to 5. And then at T3, we have the update from 3 to 5. So what's going to happen is 5 is going to receive two different withdrawals at different times. Now, how would 5 react to this? Well, since these are different AS paths, 5 is going to unbundle and create two different withdrawals to 65,002. That's just because it's received two different withdrawals representing two different paths at two different times um, in the network. So what this MRAI does is it allows 5 to wait to see, okay, I received a withdrawal from 65,003. I'm going to wait the MRAI timer until to see if I get any other withdrawals. If I get one from 65,004 in that time period, then I will only send one withdrawal to 65,002 rather than two. So this just cuts back on the amount of traffic that is going on. Now there is another thing called an implicit withdrawal in BGP. So the implicit withdrawal is that um, I just lose one path, but I still have another path. So in this case, for instance, um, if my D to AS65003 path fails, now in the beginning, I will have 100 colon colon slash 64. It'll be advertised to 65004. It'll be advertised to 65005. And then it'll also be advertised to 65003 and 65005. So 65005 has two paths in here, right? When this link goes away, this path will go away. So now there will be a withdraw from, from 65003 to 65005. Now how does 65005 react? Does it send a withdraw to 65002? Well, that doesn't make any sense because it still has a path to 100 colon colon slash 64 via 65004. So instead, what will happen is, assuming the day is 65005 has in fact advertised the path through 65003 to 65002 in the past, what will happen is, is when this link fails, 65005 will receive this withdrawal from 65003 and it will simply send a new update saying the path used to be 65005, 65003, and 65001, and the new path is 41. When the router at the edge 
of, C of 002 sees this update, it will assume that the new path replaces the old path. And again, this is called an implicit withdraw. Now we're going to hit the implicit withdraw in a little bit when we talk about multipath in route reflectors. But for now, let's just leave the implicit withdraw in there. What we're going to talk about now is something called BGP hunt. BGP convergence is actually fairly simple to understand if you just think through what the process looks like. So in this network, which is a really simple network, in fact, you could set this network up in your lab virtually, and you could set the MRAI out, the min route advertisement interval, and you can play with this network a little bit and try to understand exactly how this convergence process works. So let's say that at the beginning, um, I'm at state, steady, state, at T0, time zero, and everything has been advertised. 110 colon colon slash 64 has been advertised throughout the network. P has chosen as its best path, the path through G. Why? Well, we're going to assume that each one of these routers is in its own autonomous system. And we're going to assume that the only um, thing that is determining which path P thinks is the best is going to be the length of the AS path. So, at the beginning, at T0, P has its best path set to G with an AS path of 1, 2, right? Okay, so now, let's say that this link fails. The A's connection to 110 colon colon slash 64 is what's going to fail. So when this fails, A at T1 sends a withdraw to G, to B, to C, and D, right? Now, B, C, D, and G are going to wait the min route advertisement interval, and then they're going to send a withdraw. So at time two, G is going to send a withdraw, this is after the MRAI, remember, to P. B is going to send a withdraw to M, C is going to send a withdraw to F, and D is going to send a withdraw to E. All right, so that's cool. P receives this withdraw. What does it do? It's going to say, well, I've lost my shortest path, but what I'm going to do now is I have these alternate paths through so M, K, and M. What I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over and use my second best path, which is going to be M. So at T2, M becomes the best path for P to reach 110 colon colon slash 64. Now remember, that destination is no longer reachable. It's simply not on the network. It's not connected anywhere. At T3, F sends a withdraw to K, E sends a withdraw to H, and M sends a withdraw to P. All right? Now, when P receives M's withdraw, what does it do? It's going to say, well, I've lost my best path, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fall back on my next best path, which is now through K. So now, I'm at P, I see my best path is at K. Now, notice each one of these steps requires a min route advertisement interval to complete. Keep that in the back of your mind as we walk through this. At time four, K is going to send a withdraw to P, and H sends a withdraw to N. All right, and again, this is a min route advertisement interval step. At time four then, P is gonna run best path, and it's gonna say, oh, I've lost my route to K. Awesome, I still have a path through N, so it's gonna flip to N as its best path. At time five, N sends a withdraw to P, which then causes P to say, oh, I've lost my only route, now the route is gone. So how long did 110 colon colon slash 64, the route stay in the network once it was disconnected from A? It's going to be five times the round route advertisement interval. Now, what is the default MRAI? The default MRAI is 30 seconds. So effectively, this route on withdrawal will remain in the network for 5 by 30 seconds. It's a rough, it's a rule of thumb. It's rough. And it may or may not be exactly that. You can, of course, drop these numbers by dropping your min route advertisement interval. Many people will set their MRAI to 0 seconds in their network, which is fine. Just remember that going back to this slide, when you set your MRAI to zero, what's going to happen? You're going to have two updates here. It does make a difference in the efficiency of the overall network, what you set your min route advertisement interval to. 
in most data center fabrics, as we see, we'll see as I go through BGP on data center fabrics much, much later in this series, we set the MRAI to zero just for this reason. Now, here is another interesting situation with BGP convergence. Assume that all of these routers are running IS to IS. Okay, so we're just going to run them IS IS on all of these routers. Now, at the same time, I have um, eBGP here and eBGP here. So eBGP between A and B and eBGP between A and C. And then I have iBGP between D and B and iBGP between D and C. So we could just say the AS boundary is right here. <clears throat> now, what do we know about BGP advertisements between eBGP and iBGP? So 110 colon colon slash 64 will be advertised by A to B and by A to C. Now, this B to D is an iBGP connection. So what is the next hop going to be from the perspective of D when it receives both of these routes, one from B and one from C. That next stop is going to be down here at A someplace. Now, how do I know how to reach that next stop? I know how to reach that next stop because I'm running IS to IS on all of these links. So that gives me my next stop reachability. So this is a recursive route. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about recursives because it's not really a BGP specific thing, but that's what this is. This is a recursive route. So, from D's perspective, which route is it going to choose? Well, this metric is 2, this metric is 1, therefore the path to A is via B is cheaper. So this is the path it's going to choose. Now, let's assume for a second that B fails. What happens? D has these two updates, ISIS, um, two paths, one via B, one via C, and this is in BGP, and it has two paths to A through IS to IS. When this route fails off of D's routing table, it's going to fall back to the path through C, because that's the only path it has. And this is actually fairly quick, because all I'm doing is I'm looking at my recursive next stop and saying, oh, my route to B went away, therefore the BGP route that relies on that recursive route, that route through B to reach A, is no longer valid. So I'm going to flip to the other route I know. Awesome. Now, what happens, however, when B recovers? B comes back up. Now, when B comes back up, it's going to relearn this route to A very, very quickly because it's IS to IS. In the meantime, C is still advertising a route to 110 colon colon slash 64 via this address on A, via some address on A. So now, as soon as B comes up, ISIS is going to say you can reach that next stop via me instead of C. And then D is going to flip over because the metric is better. But what's going on with BGP? In this time frame, BGP is still converging between these four BGPs or these three BGP speakers. So when D starts shipping these traffic, these packets down to B, B has a route to the next stop, but there's no BGP running here. The BGP is not converged yet. So it'll start dropping those packets into the trash can. So that is a bad thing. So the solution, and this is something, by the way, you have to be aware of. Anytime you're dealing with underlay and overlay control planes, there's always a mismatch in the convergence speed between the underlay and the overlay. And you've got to figure out how you're going to manage that or what that means in your particular network design and how many recursive routes you have and things like this. So in this case, what you can do is you can enable something. Almost every BGP implementation has this, or almost every um, uh, most... IGP implementations like ISIS have this. Um, what you can do is you can enable something called wait for BGP, with the idea being that B, the ISIS process on B, will advertise itself as max metric until BGP has converged. How do we know BGP has converged? Well, I'm actually going to talk about that in the next slide, so I will just leave it for a second. 
The next thing we want to talk about is Graceful Restart in BGP and BGP convergence in relation to Graceful Restart. So the idea behind Graceful Restart is, is you have at least two tables in your router. You have a rib and you have a fib. Now this fib may live in software. This fib may live in hardware. It's really hard to know. Depends on the particular platform you are dealing with. When BGP goes away, the rib loses all of its context. It has no way to validate those routes are still loop free and everything like that. <clears throat> However, you can leave the routes in the rib and or the fib, depending on the implementation, and use them while BGP is converting. The risk is that you will have a temporary routing loop while you are waiting on convergence. But let's look at how this happens. First, A and B, when they form their, their adjacency, will, or their peering session, will do what's called a capabilities negotiation, and we'll talk more about that later when we talk about BGP peering a bit later, and they will decide that they can support something called a graceful restart. So what's going to happen is that when A reboots and comes back up, it's going to tell B, oops, I just went down. And B is going to come back and say, oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a timer on all my routes in my rib or my fib. And there's a way to manage this timer on most platforms. And what I'm going to say is I'm going to call this my dirty timer or my dirty bit. Um, actually, an name made up in an ITF in another bar. Um, and I believe that one was also in Washington, D.C., but I'm not positive. Um, might have been Prague or some other city. But at any rate, um, we have our rib and our fib. So we go into all the routes that have been learned via BGP, or we go down to the fib and all the fib entries, the forwarding entries that are reliant on those routes learned in BGP, and we set this dirty bit, and it's a timer. So what we do is we allow this BGP session to rebuild. And as we rebuild the BGP session, what we're doing is installing routes in the rib that pushes them down to the fib, and we're replacing the routes that have these dirty bits set with newer routes. Over time, this should replace most or all of the routes with dirty bits set. So now, once a timer goes off, there's a timer here. Usually it's 30 seconds or a minute or whatever it is. You can manage that on most platforms. What it'll do is it'll go through and clear out anything with this dirty bit in it, which will give you a clean rib or a clean fib. Well, that's it for BGP Convergence. Um, next time, we'll spend some time looking at um, intra-AS modes for using BGP, so IBGP, ways of solving the IBGP problem in BGP. <laughs>